few minutes. Yes, not a problem. Other folks wandering. Let's give them a couple more minutes. I expect to be a packed house in here, so. <laughs> you'll see the crowds come running soon, you'll hear them. <laughs> So that was my boss. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Yep. It's Noick, right? Correct. Everybody refill your coffee cup. <laughs> no. Oh, I need several cups of coffee, no matter how interesting the speakers are. To say, huh? Yeah, yeah. We want to make sure we thank uh, Nautel also for sponsoring the morning break. If you did get a chance to grab some coffee and a snack, so let's get everything going. My name's Jim Stitt. I'm the president of JMS and Associates, based out of Cincinnati. We're contract uh, and consulting engineers in the broadcast industry. With about 140 plus clients, and also. Uh, subcontractors for Gates Air, um, also the SB33 chair and a member of the programming committee here for the conference. So uh, this morning, our presentation, uh, speaking of Repack, is getting on the air with your new channel, Repack and ATSC3 Ready. Our speaker this morning is Tom Nowick. He's a broadcast sales manager for radio frequency systems, and he's gonna be speaking instead of Eddie Vanderkirken who was listed in your, uh, your program. Tom has 20 years experience in the telecom and broadcast industry. He received his BSEE degree from University of Connecticut and then began working at Radio Frequency Systems, starting in technical support, then moved to engineering transmission lines, product management for telecom and broadcast components, and is now the current role as a sales manager. He's actively involved in the repack activities and looking forward to assisting in the development of single frequency networks, as well as helping non-repack sites to update their systems for upcoming technology advances. We're pleased to have Tom here today, so let's welcome Tom Nowick. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I appreciate you coming to watch my presentation. As mentioned, initially, my boss was going to come and give this, but last minute it was given to me to present. So I'll be talking about the challenges, or in our case, looking at a broadband uh, slotted array antenna, and the challenges it was to actually design it, come up with the concept, and then get to the actual physical production of the antenna. So looking at the outline, the motivation, for building this antenna is really, we started thinking about the repack and the non-repack channels, what they would need going onto the air. We know initially a slotted array, a single channel, everyone has one of those, we have one too. And the other thought was, well, there's also the auxiliary antennas that have to be covered. So a broadband antenna could be used for auxiliary. We're looking at repack opportunities, ATSC three opportunities with these antennas also and looking at 5G broadcast applications. So we're looking at all different parts of the, um, uh, what, what is to come in our business when it comes to developing a product. So then after that, we look at the implementation, how we develop the antenna, and then adding the vertical polarization to the antenna, how we did that, and then how we made the antenna a modular design and pretty much off the shelf. So case one. The initial reason why we wanted to build this antenna, we were looking at the repack and non-repack uh, stations. So the idea behind it was, as mentioned earlier, everyone already has a single channel slotted array. So we were looking at the alternate side, which is an auxiliary antenna. Not many people are thinking about an auxiliary. Typically they were there on aux site and uh, they're not usually the same power rating that might be a little bit less, but we also wanted something that could be used for an auxiliary or a main. We're looking at something that was easy to install. That crews would not have a hard time installing, something simple. We wanted a low wind load, something that would be very minimal impact to the tower. Looked at standard patterns that were being used throughout the repack, Omni, C-170, C-160, the skull pattern, S-180. And we also wanted to put together a product that would have enough power to handle uh, one megawatt ERP. 
So these are some requirements we are looking at, thinking of the repack. It want, we want it to be broadbanded so anybody can use it if there was needed for an auxiliary. And these are traditionally H-pole antennas. So going forward with ATSC3 advances, the vertical element was something that's important we wanted to add to this particular model. So we're looking at repack and also at this point repack is more than halfway done looking at non-repack opportunities coming up next in the industry. So the picture to the right quickly just shows your main. And we were thinking a nice auxiliary antenna, broadband, easy to install to be a good backup for your main antenna. So there are other cases we were thinking about while developing this antenna or putting together a program to develop it. This is the ATSC3 advancements within the industry. So currently we're using ATSC1, which is good, but three is coming and we're preparing for it. They're doing trials and their studies. And the idea behind the ATSC3 is really adding a vertical element so you can communicate with mobile handheld devices. So this is being worked out right now, trials are being done, and we started thinking about how these networks were actually being used and how they're being implemented. So the idea simply is you have a main antenna, which is in the middle of your overall coverage area. This is a very simple pictorial picture, a nice perfect omni, and then uh, of course one antenna cannot cover everything because in a typical topographical area you might have terrains, hills, even buildings and cities and different geographies in the way. So in an SFN network, you can bring in alternate antennas around this site to fill in the gaps where the signal is weaker. So we would think about what antennas would be used to fill in these gaps. We have the main, we have the vertical on the main. So using a broadband antenna with a vertical element could be something to help fill in these single frequency networks around the main as they're being developed. So that was another thought going into why we developed this antenna. And continuing with that, the idea is we looked at five multiple antennas, four or five, depending on your terrain. It's not always easy to just put up an antenna with a tower. So that's a challenge. And we had to think about what do we do to minimize that challenge to installers of these networks. And one is you want to probably use a tower that exists. You want to co-locate on a tower. These towers tend to be telecom based. Typically, not always, because uh, SFN networks do not require a very tall tower like your standard broadcast tower. It can be smaller, maybe 500 feet, maybe less. And uh, they're trying to cover a small area around the main. So we want something that could go on at existing tower, but we also want very low wind loadings. We don't want to overload the tower with a big antenna. So we had to keep that in mind when developing this to have a low wind load, minimally intrusive antenna on an existing tower, and of course adding the elliptical polarization for that vertical element to communicate with mobile handheld devices. So repack, non-repack, ATSC3 applications were what we were looking at. Then we also had to think of what other cases exist out in the market. Another case is what they call FE MBMS, which is further evolved multimedia broadcast and multicast. So really what this is, is a, this exists out in the field today with mobile operators. They already have this technology. It started with the 3GPP um, uh, groups, went through 4G, LTE, and now 5G. They still operate and have the ability to use a cellular mobile system to broadcast signals. It does exist out there. For example, an Amber Alert is something that's broadcasted. So these systems exist, but we know with cell phone companies that uh, capacity is always a challenge to keep those systems up and running. So thinking about this and how these systems would work, how would we be able to work with these systems? Um, one of the things that we know about data systems is the fact that video data is on the rise when it comes to mobile units. So on average, we're looking at the chart to the right, we see year over year, over year mobile video is increasing and expected to increase dramatically. Reason being is a lot of people like to use your mobile devices for watching, say, YouTube, streaming videos. This is becoming very common. They're not using a phone for talking anymore. They're using it more for watching videos and hopefully in the future broadcast television. So we look at it, the mobile op operators know this, and it's right now, it's a one-to-one -one connection. You're connecting one cell phone to the tower, uplink, downlink. So there's a lot of individual connections here where if they went to a broadcast mode, they can get rid of those multiple connections and just broadcast the signal out to multiple devices at one time with nothing going back in the uplink. This could save data and capacity on the sites 
And it also could be a, a way to say, if you have, you want to cover an area, um, Super Bowl's happening as an example of an event. You know a lot of people will, will be around in one particular area, not at the stadium, not watching it, maybe watching on their mobile devices. You can simulcast, simulcastly, if I say the word right, broadcast the uh, signal out so they can all receive the same game at the same time without having them to link back and forth individually. You are saving bandwidth on the overall network. Challenges, there's not much bandwidth to work with. So you start to get that balance of, if you're not watching, say, the Super Bowl, but yet you still want to communicate with the towers, you might get an overload problem. So they are trying to work through this scenario how this can actually get to the field, how they can utilize it as the telecom carriers. So this is based on them using a broadcast channel to broadcast a event of some sort. But the way we look at it now is we know they've done trials with this, say, in Australia. I know for a fact that they did some trials and they had some problems with overloading and keeping everything very consistent. So they also look at another a concept that they call a mega cell concept, where typically when you go into broadcast mode, you're using this structure. Once again, for picture purposes, nice round omnidirectional kind of area. But you have multiple cell sites in there that's going to broadcast one signal simultaneously throughout all the sites to cover one area they know will be very uh, populated at that point. But once again, capacity overloading, they think, well, there's another concept we can use the broadcasters and their equipment versus the telecom equipment. They call it a mega cell, which is a, uh, you have a tower in the middle, a high power, high tower, uh, high tower, high power system, which is basically your broadcast system. And it can cover the same area as multiple telephone or telecom sites could. So we can utilize that instead of taking the bandwidth off telecom, we can utilize the broadcaster system. And thinking about that, it runs very similar to what we have today. We're broadcasting a signal. The telecom people can then maybe add a channel that's not being used in that area for all of their data they wanted to broadcast over their phones. So we add a channel to the combiner network. We add another uh, channel to it. And at that point, you can then turn it on and off when necessary to broadcast your signal over this area. Now we know high power, high tower. It doesn't always cover everything perfectly because of geographical issues. So we also look to add, once again, a couple small cells around it like a single frequency network, multiple antennas to cover those gaps that are really weak when it comes to data. So just a concept. This is one of the thoughts out there where telecom might add a channel to your system to broadcast a signal. So repack opportunities, non-repack, single frequency networks, which are still based around the broadcasters using their signal and their data. Then there's also the telecom or 5G approach which we might be able to work with the telecom companies to broadcast a signal for them. So we're not leaving or letting telecom take over the broadcast signal, but we can work with them in a couple different ways. Which then that leads to, well, kind of just discussed this, so the broadcast overlay, single frequency networks. But looking at the three different scenarios, what it brings us to is this is how we built our antenna. We looked at what patterns were needed for repack, what patterns were needed for the ATSC3 SFN antennas, and which ones were also needed for the uh, FE MBMS systems. So they're very similar when it comes to the general patterns needed, omnicardioid, omnioid, but the ATSC3 and the FE MBS also require a antenna with a high front to back ratio, a more directional to cover in the gaps. Polarization is either horizontal or elliptical, even could be circular, depending on which scenario you want to go to. Wind load is always critical. Frequency range, we want to cover the whole UHF band because we don't know which channels will be going in. And then the tower handling ability, or power handling ability, higher for the repack, lower for the ATSC3 and the FE MBMS systems. So five to 20 kilowatts versus 20 to 100. So with all these considerations in mind, this basically requires a bandwidth of a panel antenna, which most people have in the industry, but you also want the wind loading of a slot antenna. You don't want a really big antenna to be putting up on small towers all over when it comes to ATSC3. And also you want scalable power handling abilities. So we took all these considerations into mind and said, how do we build this antenna that covers multiple scenarios that customers would potentially need? So we know the, uh, 
broadband cavity back slotted arrays. It's nothing new. It's been out in the system, um, in the field for a long time. The technology's been there. You have directional uh, on the left, so your cavity back slotted arrays on the left hand side, a very directional pattern. And you also have an omni cross slot on the right. So the basic building blocks are something we were looking at and how to build this antenna. So now how do we implement the broadband radiation patterns? So looking through, we know for the repack and these other scenarios, ATSC3, that there are some general patterns we want to cover. Omni, cardioid, and a sector. So we start to focus on those particular patterns, and we know the azimuth pattern must stay consistent and cross a broadband, multiple frequencies, the full UHF band. And also trying to keep the wind load low, we want to keep it within the 15-inch diameter radome, so a relatively small antenna with a low wind load in a modular design. We don't want to wait, wait 12 to 14 weeks to build an antenna. We want something we can pull off the shelf, build relatively quick for an auxiliary application, or if in a pinch you need something to go up really fast, we can build it to, for you in one week or less and get it out the door. So we're thinking how to build this type of antenna, and also it's critical the VSWR must be maintained throughout the whole band. So we start to look at the parameters we gave. 15-inch radome, which is the gray circle. We want to stay within this radome at all times. Cavity back slotted array gives us a directional pattern. But now it's very broad. We want to start to create different patterns. We want to create the C-170, the S-160, or C-160, the S-180, the Omni pattern. So we start to look at how do we create the pattern with this slotted cavity back slotted array. We start to add the wings to it, but these wings, of course, can be adjusted within the radome to give you different types of patterns by adjusting the length, the choke length, and even just the where the bends are in these wings. So lots of variables and how we can actually create the different patterns within the antenna, keeping it broadbanded and a good performance. So what our engineers did is uh, they've been around for a while and we've been building these antennas, so we have a general concept that we start with. We know that it works. It works very good but it can be optimized to improve performance across the full UHF band so you have a nice, solid, consistent performance no matter where you sit, from channel 14 to channel 36. It's going to be very good. So they started to take these concepts. They built them up within a, a program, a computer-aided program. They put in their parameters. And to the right here, it's kind of like a topographical map. Blue is very low, red is very high, error. So low error in blue, red is high error. And we, when we put our parameters into this system, we get a general error reading, which is relatively high. It's not too bad. It works, but there's room for improvement. So we start to look at where we can make the improvements. We start to enter different optimization goals into there. This is uh, what pattern we want to really achieve. What's the allowable VSWR variation we can have within these antennas throughout the full UHF range. And we start to add these parameters and let the computer do some simulations and we work back and forth with different parameters. As you can see, it starts to move towards the yellow. We're starting to get less error, better improvement across the full UHF band. And then we start to also uh, work on the different wing lengths, the different fold positions within that radome to keep the patterns in the VSWR stable. So we make more adjustments, more iterations to the program. We're getting closer to a better overall consistent uh, pattern in VSWR. And we keep, keep on doing this multiple times with different uh, scenarios, different, way, way of different uh, wing lengths and different types of bends to them. So they go back and forth multiple times, so you start getting closer to that minimal error. And you start checking, is this good enough? Am I happy with it? No, maybe I want to go a little bit farther, do another iteration. I'm very close to my desired VSWR and return loss across this band until I get pretty much to where I want it to be my desired goal, which is a broadband antenna covers the full UHF band with very good electrical performance. So we take that, and this is what you actually see when you're starting to do the um, testing. The blue line at the very top that's dotted is our desired results. We want a C-170 pattern. And there are multiple iterations. As that chart showed, we kind of went from a high error down to a lower error. We went through the different steps. And you can see how the pattern went from not so good to better, 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 to the point now we have the red dotted line that is showing we simulated a consistent pattern that we wanted 
towards our theoretical pattern we wanted to achieve. So we are at that point, we're hitting our target. We are happy with what we see. Looking at it as an error versus azimuth angle, you can see once again the red dotted line is our final achievable, acceptable goal that we wanted to hit. But you can see the different iterations and how the error was off. We had to work to improve this error across the full band. And this chart is just showing the steps that we went through on the previous chart from high error to low. Each iteration, it's not always perfect. You might go up a little bit in error and back down, but it does ultimately show you we got to the point where we're happy with minimal error in a good stable pattern. And here's an example of on the left, theoretical, our target versus what we achieved via programming. And then on the right is a measure pattern that was actually taken of a, a finished product that we had put together and built. So we can see we achieved the goal we ultimately wanted to hit with this antenna, a nice C-170 pattern that was very close to what we wanted to hit and right on target. What about polarization? Right now, this is this H-pole at the moment. We're going to get to the V-pole soon. Uh, this is just showing an example of our far field range. We built a full array, put it up on top, and ran it through the full UHF pattern from low to high. You can see the consistency in the pattern from low to high end, how we were able to maintain that pattern no matter where you are within the UHF frequency range. And then uh, to <clears throat> achieve the different types of patterns, here's just some examples showing you exactly what's inside the ray domes if you were to break them apart. From the C-170, C-160, you can see how the different wings are actually put inside there to create those different patterns, giving you more front to back ratio on the C-170 versus the 160. And also looking forward to ATSC-3 applications, potentially you want a higher front to back ratio and a more directional pattern. So you can see once again how the wings are being shaped to keep that signal going forward. Now, still H-pole only. Yes? I assume you've got a lot of these stacked vertically. Yes. Correct. For yes. So right now we're just looking at the side, just one of them, but yeah, it would be stacked. And we'll show you the module design, how they look inside soon. But then we're looking at one cavity to start to get the general pattern and the general outline of what the antenna would look like. And then we start to stack the cavities to build the higher gains. So now implementing the vertical polarization, your question is, came up previously. Typically in a slotted array, when you add a vertical polarization, you're just putting a vertical element over the slotted array, the H pattern already, or the H pole uh, cut out within the pole. So it's a half wavelength dipole sitting on top of it, depending on your ratio, what you want to achieve, 25 to 30 percent on average is typical. We would then adjust that angle of the vertical dipole to achieve your vertical element of your pattern. Uh, in this case, it's a single channel. This type of design works great for a single channel because it's covering exactly that channel that you want. So, but it's only 30 megahertz, it's not broadband. We cannot use this concept when it comes to a broadband antenna. So we started looking at what other concepts exist in the, out in the field. One of them is to make a wider dipole, so a flatter, wider dipole that will give you a wider range of coverage on the vertical element, but still, it's not broadband. It only adds about six megahertz of overall vertical coverage to that uh, H-pole. So a regular dipole and a wider dipole do not cover exactly what you're looking for when you want a full broadband antenna with a vertical element in it to make an E-pole. So the engineers started to look at different concepts, what existed out in the field, and what antennas that we know that work for a broadband array. And one of them was a log periodic antenna, uh, older, proven technology that is very broadband and very stable when it comes to a directional pattern. So you know, in the UHF range, your wavelengths may vary by over five inches. These antennas are very broadband. It can cover that you know, variation with a very consistent pattern. So they started to look at these types of antennas, the log periodic, the Yagi types, and say, how can we add this to our, our new antenna to improve the broadband coverage of the vertical element, to improve the performance? So they came up with a design to the right. That is your vertical dipole sitting over your open H-pole slotted array. And it has a very log periodic type uh, design to it from the wider elements on the back to skinnier in the front. And when they tested this design after multiple iterations, they were able to come up with a very stable vertical element being added to a broadband antenna. 
Initially, pre-repack, we covered the full UHF band, even up to 720, very stable. But post-repack, now we're dropping down to 608 megahertz. You can see it's even more stable across the full UHF band. This allows us now to have a nice auxiliary antenna with stable performance on the horizontal and vertical element being added to the antenna. And we can adjust it anywhere up to 30 degrees uh, or 30 percent vertical, giving you an elliptical pattern. And it will be consistent across the full broadband. And, and to the right, we see the picture of the dipole. And adding it into the system with still the 15 inch diameter radome that we want to be inside of. You can see the dipole sits above the horizontal slotted cavities, but we then curve it to actually fit within the radome. But that curvature was part of the design. Everything now fits within there, giving you consistent performance in a consistent pattern. So we were able to achieve what we wanted when it comes to performance and patterns, but now how do we build the antenna? How do we implement this? So we started looking at our building blocks in a slotted broadband array. The way we wanted to build this to be kind of modular was we started looking at four bay stacks. So a, a one four bay uh, stack is a building block for this particular antenna. They're very compact. They are uh, high power. So you put them, one four bay can handle 17 kilowatts, two of them combined together. Typically, these antennas will be an eight bay to start. You can have 34 kilowatts in this antenna when you, as the building block. We've done a lot of testing with it. And as we build these antennas, this is tested outside. We proved that the return loss performance was very stable, very low across the full UHF band. So we know that we've proven this design, an eight bay design within a 15 inch radome can perform very well and very low VSWR. Yes. Can you back up a few slides of, of when we had a, a cross section of the barrier? That one. Now, I'm afraid that I have a little difficulty finding the vertical element in there. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a pointer. Can you help me a little. Sure. It's actually at the very top, that red line on the top, and it's blue on the first one. It's curved right around the rail. If we go back up here, that's it right there at the top. It looks like uh, two long periods pointing at each other. Oh. And it sits there and it is curved and sits diagonally over the opening of the H pole slot. It's at a diagonal angle. Yes, to give you that vertical element, the 30%, 25, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So, sorry I'm so dumb. Uh, the, the horizontal element is where? right underneath it. It's that square slot underneath it, and you have two exciters right in there that are generating the signal out of the horizontal. So, Let's see if there's a better picture. So that, yeah, this is a horizontal element. It's a piece of sheet metal. It's square with a, uh, this, yeah, talking, just look at this one right here. Take out the vertical element. It's just a piece, square piece of sheet metal that's pointing up. It's got some wings coming out the outside of it. So that's your horizontal element. I'm trying to find a better picture. Yeah. So there's four of them are going to be stacked on the right. There's two bays stacked right there. The vertical element is on top, and below it, you have the two exciters divided by that piece of sheet metal in the middle. That square or rectangular portion is your horizontal bay. It's not, it's a simple square. There's nothing much to it, really. The two exciters are buried in the orange things, right? Yes, those are the exciters. So that's what's generating the signal that's then being radiate, radiated out of that cap. And the horizontal element is between the two exciters. No, it is the actual cavity itself. <coughs> the exciters just generate the signal, and as it generates inside that cavity, it's going to then radiate out, and the size of that slotted cavity there is actually what's going to uh, push your pattern outwards. If you think of a standard uh, slotted array where you have the holes cut in the pole in the center, it's the same idea, but you have a square rectangular box versus a elliptic or uh, a round hole. So I think I see now that the horizontal 
element in quotes it are actually slots. Yes. Essentially, they're a slot. Yeah. They're just multiple cavities stacked. Got it. Like if you if I have the old picture here quickly. Yeah. Where this over here is your one slot on your standard single channel. The cavity now is basically copying that, but it's square. It's the same idea. To have the bigger rectangular pattern, you do more of a broadband characteristic. But it's the same thing. That hole in the pole in that cavity are the same, essentially, simple terms. Good? So, horizontal, vertical on top, and then the picture and everything in there. So your horizontal is that blue. That's your rectangular cavity we were looking at just sideways, and then your vertical element sits on top of it, that red curved area at the top. If you look at like what's inside the antennas, it's not much. It looks very simple, but it's very complicated the way the RF just interacts with these different openings. They always say, uh, and even on the telecom side, you're sheet metal experts when you make panel antennas because all you're doing is folding sheet metal in different ways to create different patterns. And that's all it really is. The slotted cavity back to ray is just folded sheet metal, very broad band. It's just containing that in a very uniform pattern with good performance becomes the challenge. And I think we talked about the building blocks, a four channel, or a four, four bay. This was a testing we had done. And uh, these are the actual antennas that we came up with. We ended up developing this eight bay type antenna. You have two four bay modules within this radome, two separate inputs, a couple of your basic patterns, your C170, C160, S180. And then we take that building block, the eight bay, and start to just stack it with equal power dividers going into each one of them. So from a 16 to 24, even up to a 32 bay, it's very modular. We can put one together based off your requirements, your power handling needs, and the more bays you stack, the higher the power rating could be for one of these antennas. And it's just a picture here of a 16 bay unit that we had put together in Meriden, Connecticut. Uh, we build the antennas there. And uh, we were just testing it outside in a free range environment to get the performance readings off of it. So this was one of our test antennas we built in the beginning just to prove that everything works and the modular design can go together very easy. Do you test them horizontal like that or do you stay them up vertical? Uh, in this case, when we build the full antenna, we test them this way to get kind of a free range or open uh, far field reading on it. We don't have the far field range in Connecticut anymore. We have one in Australia, but we know laying them this way Underneath it, that blue material is an absorber material. It's going to absorb any RF going downwards. So it's just reflecting upwards, and we're going to measure over on top of it uh, the actual pattern coming out when it comes to the different power levels throughout. There are two methods to be used. One is right now, it's a proven method that most of us use. It's kind of you have uh, sensors on top of like a pole that goes over the top of the antenna and takes readings as it goes over measuring the different strengths. Then you put that together and you see a pattern forms out of that, how strong the signal is from as you move up and down the antenna. We also do have a drone that we use that can fly over the antenna to get a reading of the vertical or yeah, the uh, elevation pattern. So, but challenges with that, the drone can only go up so high. I think uh, there's a limit to how high it can go. In order to get a true far field reading, you need to be like a couple thousand feet up and FC, FAA will not allow that. So you can't quite get that true reading, but you are high enough to get a good reading out of it. You know where the nulls are anyway. Yes. The nulls are not a, a function of real distance. Yeah. Yes, they do have a far field range down there that you saw in the previous picture. It does rotate the antenna, does a full 360. So we had one in uh, Meriden and we shipped it out after the DTV build out to England for a big project out there and it never came back. <laughs> so we have, if you ever came, come to our plant, you'll see where it was sitting and then where the shell was left. 
So we want to get it back, but we know these methods work just as well and give you the same results. It's just simpler and it doesn't require really, really expensive equipment. Because also on the inside, what, what you're not seeing here really is we do have uh, anechoic chambers inside too. We do build one small section, bring it to an anechoic chamber and rotate the full antenna around and do do the full testing inside on a single bay, maybe two bays combined. From there, we can then bring it outside and do build the full antenna and test it. The more gain, the more stacking you do, the further you've got to get away. But you can still read the, how the power is changing as you go over the top of the antenna with the sensors, how much stronger it's getting that will form that signal for you. So it is, you know, it's, it is commonly used out there. A lot of people do use a method of actually reading over the antenna to see what the different strength levels are. And in the equipment, the analyzers are set up for that. So we, we do get a very consistent, true reading out of it. But we've, we've also proven on the far field range the patterns too. So that essentially is just our final check when we build an antenna to prove that the patterns are what we say they are. If we were designing the antenna, it would be far field range definitely, just to prove patterns. So this is production check out. Made while you were bolting it together. Correct. We build the full antenna assembly inside and then we ship it and roll. We test it inside quickly, then we roll it outside so there's no interference technically. Everything's absorbing, uh, being absorbed on the back of it. And on the front side, it is a free open range, so nothing should be reflecting. We get a good, honest reading. And it's just a final check to prove that it is what we say it is. If, you, if you're ever up in Connecticut, I would love to show you the plant and show you exactly how we do it. So anybody who ever wants to come up, you're more than welcome to. I live not too far from the plant. I can always bring you in. I know it's not that close to Ohio, but if you're ever in that area, reach out to me. I can show you what we do. So uh, back to the modular design, as we were just talking about, the way we put these together, your radome has been removed. But you see there are two, four uh, bay sections stacked on top of each other. And how we change the designs between the different patterns are really adding different wings or reflectors around the outside of them to create different patterns, the C160, C170, S180. And also we can add the vertical element if desired by the customer by adding a ver uh, the exciter for the vertical element to be added to the unit. These, these wings, are they silver plated? Or? They're aluminum. Everything inside there is aluminum. We just got to make sure everything is tightly. There is no loose connections because loose connections vibrate and cause uh, passive intermodulation. Don't want that. But it's essentially all sheet metal inside of this antenna. We don't want them to be too heavy. <laughs> we all know aluminum corrodes. But they are protected by the radome. So it takes a, quite a while to corrode because they're not directly in the elements. But this is how, like all the, even the, uh, the big single channel slotted arrays, those poles are aluminum. They would be full steel. They're very heavy. Some of the top mounts are steel. They can be very thick, but they are very, very heavy antennas too. So we, especially on this one, thinking of a auxiliary antenna, we did not want to be too heavy. We wanted to keep it relatively lightweight. All the cell phone antennas are the same thing, sheet metal, aluminum. But that, that's our, our, our approach was building blocks, different wings. You can add the uh, vertical element if needed and required by the customer. And we can put this together with pieces that are on the shelf, the different four bay arrangements, stack them, different wings, different elements. And it takes one to two weeks, probably less than that, to put one together and get it out the door versus 12 to 14 weeks for a standard slotted array to be built. And usually the longest lead time for our standard single channel is just getting the pole. That takes at least <laughs> usually eight to 10 weeks for a pole to come in and build the antenna. Yeah, one to two weeks, then you're done. Just an example of our system configuration. On the left was the concept. We have a uh, 24 bay unit sitting there, three eight bays, equal power dividers attached to the tower. And then you have a Cables running to each one of the uh, four bay modules inside the eight bay um, antenna. 
And to the right is just an example of one that had been installed, a 16-bay unit on the tower. You can see the power divider network in the back and the cables running to each one of the uh, antennas. So 15-inch diameter radome, very low wind load, very minimal uh, effect to the tower compared to what it could have been. But it's, that was our thought going forward is we wanted something small, high power, minimal wind load, used for repack and non-repack applications, and also could be used for single frequency networks and the uh, 5G or the mega cell concept. So that was our thoughts when we built this antenna, and this is what we came up with. So that was it for the presentation. I think I hit my 45 minutes. Yes? What about uh, simulating an omni? You put three or four of them around the tower? In this case, yeah. No, it's going to have an effect on the pattern no matter what you do. It will reflect some power. So being an open structure, a majority of it will go through, but it's not perfectly round. You're going to get that kind of off round on that one side, and that's where we do the um, pattern analysis to show you what exactly you would achieve based off your tower structure. So it's. Uh, if it came to that, you wanted an omni pattern, we, if we know your tower structure and how you built it, we can simulate what the effect of the tower would be on your omnidirectional pattern. Right up to the computer. Yes. Yes. Your UHF only, no VHF? We'd, for this particular model, it is UHF only, correct. We have different types of antennas for VHF high band, not low band. Yeah, so they're more of a panel type that can be either elliptically or horizontally polarized, even circular. Oh, in the back. You said for an SFN that the phase six had to be the center. Does it have to be the center? Not always. That was a simple picture. So depending on where your site is and what you're trying to cover, if you have an area of high population versus very low, maybe it's more directional, you still want to fill in the gaps in that area you're trying to cover. A lot of the concept is still being worked out. We don't have all the details, but simply put, that's kind of the idea around it. Well, the elliptical is really to communicate with the mobile device, the cell phone or whatever mobile device was out there. We know Qualcomm tried that in the past, but at this point, it's uh, this is coming with ATSC3. It's part of the technology that will communicate and allow the broadcasters to really utilize their full bandwidth and maybe that unused area they can sell some data. So it's definitely a bonus for the broadcasters to have elliptical on there to communicate with that mobile device when the time comes but it also leads to these other networks, like single frequency, where you can put multiple channels in, and once again, using the broadcaster's data to improve their overall, say, cash flow, because you're selling more of your capacity. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, by the way, a recording of this session, uh, as well as a preservation, uh, presentation, will be available on our uh, website for the next few weeks following the conference. Okay, uh, the next breakout session in this room will be at 11.15 a.m. We'll focus on antennas and RF equipment for ATSC 3.0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Come